They came out of this flat shouting, Hey, Ra, who equipped? Which is the Egyptian name for the sun. Promptly doors opened, ladies appeared. Oh, to see the naked Kofi. Followed by a woman draped in red, and me bringing up the rear with a saucer, I God knows why, going up. And he did this on every floor. Hey, Ra, who equipped? So he goes up and to the roof and he hails the sun at dawn. And he goes down. And after this he decided he cast the Yigji. And it said there was a great change coming. And sure enough there was. He was thrown out of the flat within 24 hours. He was by now becoming paranoid. And if any of his followers disagreed with him, he saw it as betrayal. When the mathematician Norman Mudd fell out with Crowley, he was cursed and told that he would die by the rope and by water. Some time later, Mud was found in the sea with a rope around his neck. It was a classic case of self-fulfilling prophecy, for Mud had really believed in Crowley. Along with Crowley's growing paranoia came an increasing thirst for publicity. At least twice he tried to plant false reports of his death in the press, and he became addicted to lawsuits. But behind all this was a real bitterness, stemming from what he regarded as his neglect and ill-treatment by the public, and perhaps also from a sense of failure as a magician and as a poet. He was a megalomaniac. He longed to be famous. It was a great grief to him that he wasn't better known than he was. I remember Crowley writing to me after I had mentioned him in the book and praised his cooking because he was a remarkably good cook. He wrote on the flyleaf of the book, on Crowley, the immortals ironically look. He sought fame as a poet, but found it as a cook. People have wondered whether Crowley was still taking himself seriously. The answer is that he still took himself very seriously indeed, but in a new and disconcerting way. In his writings, Crowley frequently attacks mystics who receive private revelations and at once conclude that these are valid for all humanity. Yet, in the last twenty years of his life, he increasingly failed to distinguish between the magical methods which were to lead all men to the knowledge of their own true wills and the revelations in the Book of the Law which were the product of his personal guardian angel. He began to claim they were inspired in every letter, exactly the way in which his Plymouth Brethren family had regarded the Bible. In the thirties, he seems to have been half convinced that the age of Crowleyanity was the same thing as the advent of the Third Reich. He maintained the illusion by deciding that although he, Crowley, had been rejected, Hitler had long before been inspired by the Book of the Law and was acting on Thelemic principles all along. Dr. William Sargent blames his condition on drugs. He started experimenting with the use of all sorts of drugs, and he started to use ether and uh, he used hashish, and he wrote a very good pamphlet about hashish. He was one of the first people to, to really put down and record the effects of hashish. Then, unfortunately, he got onto cocaine, and his diary absolutely falls to pieces at the end. He talks rubbish, really, and you can see this sort of general grandiose paranoid state uh, emerging. I think if he'd never gone on to cocaine, he might have ended his life very differently. Of course, the tragic end, my, my brother was down on the south coast, just after the war, in, and in the boarding house, he was crowded down and out, really. He ended very tragically and very alone. Long before Crowley's death, cocaine had given way to heroin. Gerald York takes a charitable view of his addiction because Crowley was an asthma sufferer and around 1920, the drug was first prescribed for him as a cure. He got caught up with what he called the storm fiend. That's to say, he took heroin to carry his asthma, and he couldn't have all the heroin because the asthma returned, and he died a heroin addict. But to the day of his death, he kept a daily record of the intake. He did nothing casually. In 1944, Crowley was bombed out of his London rooms and eventually moved into the seedy atmosphere of his Hastings boarding house. He died on the 1st of December 1947 and five days later a funeral service was held in the chapel of the crematorium at Brighton. Louis Wilkinson was one of the executors.
I was commissioned to read from the hymn of Pan, a poem that he wrote, uh, one of his religious poems, which is in parts very ecstatic, with Eo Pan, Eo Pan often repeated. And I remember that at the undenominational chapel, on the one side there was the press, and on the other side there were his devotees. And I remember the intense excitement caused by the devotees by my reading of the hymn to Pan, of how I could hear, first of all, murmurs, and then much louder, cries of Eo Pan, Eo Pan, from the audience of the devotees, and how the look on the faces of the reporters seemed to grow more and more amazed and uncomprehending. The notoriety which Crowley enjoyed during his life has continued after his death, although not necessarily in ways which would have pleased him. The OTO and Crowleyanity survive with centres in Germany, Switzerland, Britain, America and Canada. There has been a definite growth of interest in the serious aspects of Crowley's law of Thelema. A few of his writings, in particular his textbooks on yoga and magic, are appreciated as contributions to mysticism and comparative religion. But the recent upsurge of interest in the occult has produced a crop of occult groups with doubtful and sometimes nasty purposes. These see nothing in Crowley but the debauched black magician. They are followers of the Crowley myth as enshrined by the Sunday Express. Those who knew him are in no doubt that he deserved better than that. But as always, Crowley was his own worst enemy, and the impression left by his declining years is largely to blame. For the last word on cults and followers was spoken by Crowley's younger and wittier self, the self of 1907, when he was practicing magic but had not yet become solemn, when he could even lampoon one of his most devoted admirers. I remember a poem that he wrote called A Thousand Years Hence, when he imagined himself as having founded a new religion and uh, meeting a young woman who was going to worship at his shrine. Where are you going so meek and holy? I'm going to temple to worship Crowley. Oh, then Crowley is God then. How did you know? Why, it's Captain Fuller who told us so. How do you know that Fuller is right? I'm afraid you're a wicked man. Good night. The Wickedest Man in the World was written and presented by James Webb. The reader was Hugh Dixon, and the program was produced by Gwyneth Henderson.